lives in our world being turned upside down like that? Now, the second half of the book, he deals with his theory of existentialism, and I'm not going to preach on existentialism. I'm going to preach from the Word of God. But he, he talks about his, his theory of existentialism and his philosophy of psychiatry, which is logotherapy. Do you know how far I got into the second half of the book? About a page and a half, and I said, okay, that's enough for me. We want to look today at finding meaning and purpose in suffering. In my years of ministry, I had, I had the great privilege of being a volunteer chaplain at the Reading Hospital. And I, I never had a problem visiting anyone's hospital room. But what I enjoyed more than anything, and I shouldn't say enjoy, but what I found more fulfilling and what I thought was my niche was being in, in, in emergency situations, in the emergency room or the sick intensive care or the medical intensive care unit. I think it's because there, there was such an immediate need and we helped to fill that need. I hope we did. But... Many times people had the same questions. When we are faced with tragedies, when we're faced with trials, and when we are faced with suffering, we often ask, now some of these questions are asked because the news, the person giving us the news may have already given us this, this information. But this is what I've heard. If people say, they'll say, who? Say that to me again. Who was involved in this? What happened? Where did it happen? When? How? There are some of the questions that may be asked, but inevitably, it always comes to some point it has for me personally, and I've heard it from people that I've ministered to, and even friends, they'll come to the question of why? Why? Now, when I was first a Christian, I became a Christian when I was 15 years old. I heard people say, my aunt, my mother, somewhat. Other people say, you should never ask why. That's not even biblical. <coughs> but biblical. Who in the Bible asked why? On the cross, Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus asked why. It is inevitable that people will ask why. Now, I don't want to take them down the road of existentialism, but I want to take them down a biblical route. There was another man who pastored the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. He had a, a radio program. His name is Dr. James Montgomery Boyce. What a preacher. I don't know if you ever heard him. He's dead probably 10 or 15 years or better now. Died rather young in his early, late 50s, early 60s. But his, the philosophy of his ministry was to help people to think and act biblically. What does the Bible say? And Habakkuk said to God, he questioned God too. He said, Oh Lord, how does Habakkuk chapter 1? Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. What Habakkuk is saying is, I'm, I'm praying and nothing's happening. See, Habakkuk was having a crisis of faith. That's when what we believe in just isn't working out in the experience and the circumstances of our life. Why dost thou show me iniquity? Why are you even showing me that the, you have seen the iniquity of Israel? And cause me to behold grievance. For spoiling and violence are before me. There are that rise up strife and contention. And this is what his conclusion was. And God's going to help him think better about this. But he says, therefore the law is slack. Something wrong with your word, God. That's what he was saying. And judgment doth never go forth. You're never going to judge these people. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceeded. Now Habakkuk would get a revelation. God told him what he was going to do. He said, I'm going to do a work that you're not even going to believe. 
two great questions have been posed to me in, when I heard this thing. The first one I heard a lot from my mother. And that is, why do good things happen to bad people? And then I've heard people say to me, why do bad things happen to good people? That's kind of based on the premises that, that there are good people. Jesus said there's none good but God. Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do the wicked prosper? Well, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 5. We'll look at that other question in a few moments. Why do bad things happen to good people? But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, but he said, he said I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And then he says, why? That ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. He's, what he's saying is, act like me. And it says why, he does, why we should do so. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. God blesses even the unjust. Now, we've been conditioned to believe that if we're good, God will bless us and or only bless us the good. And that's kind of innate in, in human thinking. We do that all the time with children and grandchildren. Now, if you're a good boy, I'll see if you get some ice cream. Mm -hmm. I guess that's kind of a manipulation. If you're a good boy, we'll see if you get some ice cream. If you're a good girl, God, God will buy you a doll baby or a toy. My wife does it to me. She says, if you're a good boy, I'll make you bacon. I'm a good boy. Man, if I'm double good, maybe it'll be maybe it'll be two pounder, maybe she'll throw some spam in there. All right. But we tend to believe that God is going to be nasty to the ungodly, and there will be nothing but good, nothing but good things will happen to the just. <coughs> and that just doesn't work out in human experience. Jesus said this, in this life, Jesus, don't finish that sentence. In this life, you shall have what? Tribulation. I'm disappointed. Disappointed that that's the way that it's going to go down. Why does God bless, and that's kind of shocking to think, God blesses the ungodly. Why does God bless the unjust? Because by his very nature, he, he says here in Matthew, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that despitefully use you, because I do the same thing. Why is that? Because God is good, and he's kind, and he's loving. Paul said in Romans chapter 2, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? God who forbears, he's long suffering. Do you want a definition for the word long suffering? It is to suffer long. He's forbearing. He puts up with it. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Now, I've had people say to me already, I'm praying for my loved one that God will make their life really miserable so they'll get saved. Well, that'd be a motivation for me right now. Kick me around. That'll make me want to come to God. Our prayer should be, God, bless them. Help Show them your goodness. God is good. He's benevolent. He's not vindictive. He's not. But you say that, hey, the Bible says God's a God of wrath. He is a God of wrath. In verse 5 of Romans 2, he says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, 
treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. One day, he talks about the day of wrath. One day, the day of wrath will come. But now, what day is it today? It is the day of his grace. And God's wrath is held in check by his grace and his goodness. God is, we remember the prayer my mother taught me. When I was a boy, God is great, God is good, God is thanking for our food. By his hand we are led. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. When I was a teenager and I got saved, I, I guess you know, I, I know I thought I knew everything. I knew almost everything. <laughs> thought I knew everything. And Mom would pray that prayer. And I think she pray that prayer. But what a lot of theology is there. God is great. God is good. And we should be thankful. And we should be asking Him to lead us by His name. Many people stumble over this, that God is good to the ungodly. I've heard people say to me, why can't I get anywhere in life? Why am I suffering? And that guy over there, like, he, he hangs out at the beer garden and and he's not saved. And look at everything he has. Look at, all, look at his house. Look at his car. I like when they say to me, he has no problems at all. You don't know what he may be going through. Yeah, right. okay. People have said to me, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Uh, uh, I, you know, people say to me, don't you think it's awful that... Uh, this ball player makes millions and millions of dollars. I don't care what he makes. I really don't care. I don't care what the other guy makes. I just worry about my, me, myself, and I. Doesn't matter. Many stumble over this. The psalmist did. Turn with me to Psalm chapter, or not chapter, but Psalm 73. And the psalmist writes, we start with verse 1. I've had loved ones that have actually, this has been a stumbling block for them. And it's human nature to wonder about the other guy. Peter did that. What about this other disciple? He said, don't worry about that. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He was saying, but as for me, I was struggling with something, and I almost fell away because of it. And he tells us what it was in verse 3. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I was watching the wicked and I saw they prospered and it stumbled me. My feet were almost gone. Oh, it almost wiped me right off of my feet. God, how can you bless the unrighteous? Verse 12. Skip it down. He says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. This is where he started to slip. He said, well, I was thinking, I have cleansed my heart in vain. These guys, their heart, their heart isn't clean, and yet they prosper. And I have cleansed my heart in vain. That's why I hear people say stuff like that. And I washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I have been plagued, troubled and chastened, punished every morning. Now surely he wasn't punished every morning. But remember, his perspective is all messed up because where does he have his eyes? On the wicked and their prosperity. So the best advice I was ever given by anyone is my pastor who's been with Jesus now 10 years or better. And one of the things he used to always say is, buddy, better keep your eyes on Jesus or you're going to fall away. Better keep your focus on Christ. Don't be looking at people. They're going to be disappointing you. That's right. What disappointing you. Better keep your eyes on Jesus. 
Why is it that that guy is younger than me and he's been more successful in his life and career, maybe even ministry, than me? Better keep your eyes on Jesus. Because the psalmist, his perspective was all messed up. <clears throat> I had one, one family member, well, my mother. My mother was a widow at age 43. And it was extremely bitter and painful for her. And I'd hear her say sometimes and say, they've been married 45, 50 years. They don't even like one another. I loved your daddy. And God took him from him. Well, I don't know that God took him from you, Mom. It just happened. I hear people say that kind of stuff. We can, we can stumble over those things. Look at verse 16. How did he get out of this? He said, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. In the presence of God comes understanding, comes enlightenment. And that's where he, what happened to the Psalms. He, he began to see, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou canst not let them down in destruction. He begins to describe, he knows what's going to happen to them ultimately, how they are brought into desolation, as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors, as a dream when one awakens. So, O Lord, when thou awakenest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. This time he felt conviction, because he knew he had his heart where it should not be. So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was at best, I was as a beast before thee. God, I, I just wasn't, wasn't focused where I should be. So people have asked me, I've had them ask me, how come that guy isn't serving Jesus, but he has the material blessings of this world? Why is it that some of the most righteous people, or can we say it that way, the people that really love the Lord, yet they live in such tremendous poverty? We don't have to go far to see that, really. We see it here in our own country, but we go overseas. There was a missionary to Haiti. Uh, he died young also. I don't know. We'll talk about that in a moment too. He died young. Uh, but he told the story when he came home one time that there was a woman who was coming to the services with her children. And he said the men even were astonished. Even the Haitians that took up the offering, they were astonished. Amazing, you know, but they were astonished. She was throwing dried corn into the offering plate. That's her time. And they said to him, preacher, they knew where it was coming from. They said, Go find out where she's getting that corn. What she fed her family is she would go out into the fields where the cattle were. And out of the no matter where to put it, Menorah, cow chips. She would pick the undigested corn that was in that, and she would wash it and grind it down to make their cakes or tortillas, whatever. And that's what she was feeding her family. So she tithed on that. Missionary told the men of the church there. He said, "I know where it's coming from." Pastor, what should we do? Take her offering and put it in the, put it in the church office. We're not going to deny her. her offering. Wow. Why would God let a woman like that live in such, such terrible poverty? Remember, it is the poor, the scripture says, that are rich in faith toward God. What happens here? is only important as to how it, or what it does in us. And 
when I leave this life and stand before pearly gates, they're not going to say, uh, you had a lower car. That's a check mark off of you. You never made more than this amount in one, uh, one year. That's a check mark off. Jesus said, a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things of which he possesses. Why would Jesus say that? Because Jesus looked at things from a spiritual perspective. Think and act biblically. So it leads me to my next question that I hear people say, why do bad things happen to good people? I got a few, these are not all inclusive. I'm not gonna cover everything, because I don't know. But sometimes, number one, sometimes we may never know why something happened when it did. We can ask God, but we won't get an answer. Well, he, he doesn't leave us hanging out to dry. In his silence, what does he give us? He gives us his grace. In, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you know the story. Paul was given to him a thorn in the flesh because of the many revelations that he had, lest he be exalted in his flesh and the messenger of Satan to buff me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And three times, I don't know what his thorn in his flesh was. A lot of people have speculated. I would have called it say it was a thorn in the flesh, but it was something bothersome enough that three times Paul went to God and pled, prayed that this thing be removed from him. Sometimes we take the sufferings or the tragedies or the trials that we're going through and we say it's very natural. We say, God, why? I don't know why this is happening. God, why? We said it's okay to ask questions. We're not questioning the goodness, the character, the righteousness, the sovereignty of God. But we're asking for an explanation. Not a problem with that. But sometimes we never fully find out. Sometimes I say to myself, I just can't wrap my mind around what's going on. I just can't. But this is what God said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He gives us his grace. Remember Psalm 73? He says, I went into the sanctuary. He came into God's presence and he had some enlightenment. God gave him grace. Sometimes it's not for us to know why. It doesn't say we can't ask why, but it's not for us to know why. But we better get into God's presence and say, you know, God help me in this. And he gives us his grace. Many years ago, we had gone through a tough time as a family. And we moved home from out west of Pennsylvania to here. And Kitty and I were both working in a shoe factory. We only had the, the girls at that time. Jordan wasn't born yet. And we were given a highly, high recommendation of a young woman who, as my grandmother would say, she minded children in her home. She was a babysitter. We went to pick the girls up after work one afternoon, and the woman came down and put our oldest star. First thing I saw, I saw my, this one back here, it was as red as a lobster. She was just a baby, not even a year old yet. Red as a lobster. I knew she was out in the sun, it was spring. I can tell you the exact date because it was my, mother, the, my mother's birthday. And I said to Kitty, get the kids, because I'm coming back. And she placed our oldest in the car. She had put on a short outfit, which was okay because it felt warm that day. But she looked at me as she put Rachel in the car. When we got home, and Kitty got the, I think I got Alice out of the car. Kitty got Rachel out of the car. I heard Kitty from behind me say, Oh dear God, David, this child has been beat. Now, Kitty would know what a beating looked like because 
her mother, beat by her father constantly when she was growing up. That's the hell Kitty lived with as she grew up. I was in shock. I didn't know anything. The doctors told us later. that we were so fortunate that this woman did hit her just a few inches above where some of the marks were because that would have been at her kidneys and she could have easily damaged her kidneys. This woman had used a vulgar four-letter word. Rachel was about four years old at the time and she said, you shouldn't say that, that makes Jesus cry. And the woman took off this mesh belt with a thick belt on and beat her within an inch of her and quickly dumped her into a cold, ice cold bag to get the swelling down. At least she did that much. I debated whether I'm going to tell that story, but so it's out now. I'll tell you what happened with me. I had a tough time with God for a while. I had a tough time with God. And I would go into prayer and I would say, I want to be here. I can't talk to you. I'll just sit here. I didn't understand why. One day I was driving in the country and I, I was angry at God. How could you let this happen? I said to God, we dedicated that kid to you. I asked you to protect her. Where were you? Rough, rough, he looked rough and rough. 
He was Scotch Canadian. His name was Robert Burgess. First, first day of this is, good morning, brethren. I'm Robert Burgess. <laughs> and you thought, oh, dear God, what am I in store for here? Yeah. He had a, he had a, he had a uh, doctorate of theology. He had a PhD from Clarksville Theological Seminary. I struggled. One of the courses that Brother Crozier taught was theological terms. And I was, a, I was a loss in that class. I didn't really get to take notes. I thought there would be a handout. I was so used to high school. It even gave us one of those little brown composition books you had when you were in school. And what about the second or third day of lectures, one guy said to me, I'm going to write this stuff down. I said, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I borrowed somebody's book. But I understand these say, uh, even when they told us the definition. And one day in Theology 1, I just wasn't getting it. And we began to talk about the sovereignty of God. And he opened up the discussion. Some guys were giving some great answers. I understand what they were talking about. It was over my head. And Brother Burgess, he'd sit there and he'd that's nice. That's nice. You read the book, did you? That's nice. Beautiful. And finally, he said, Brethren, I'm going to give you the definition of the sovereignty of God. I got my pen out. Somebody go ahead and read this stuff down. And he told us, the sovereignty of God means this. God is boss. God is boss. I'm thinking, I came all the way from Pennsylvania and long out of the air. I got a PhD from Clarksville Theological Center. Tell me God is boss. Sometimes we just have to accept that God's in control and God is, he doesn't need me. And Burns said it that day. He said, God don't need your breath. He can exist and function without your help. And sometimes we have to, we have to accept his wisdom and his sovereignty. That's a hard pill to swallow, I understand. I get that. But sometimes we don't give an answer. Sometimes there's suffering and tragedy comes into our lives, so to give God the opportunity to reveal his glorious works. In John chapter 9, the disciples, there was a blind man. Jesus came, came by a blind man, and the disciples, being the great theologians they were, said this to Jesus. Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Have you ever met those people that if you have any kind of sickness in your life, it's because you have sin in your life? Yeah. Uh, oh, you want to see those people? You don't get away from me. Sin's going to act out here in a hurry. <laughs> Leave me. Get away from me. Who did sin, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. That this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. And God allows it so that he can do a great work and manifest his glory. And that can be hard. That process can take time. And maybe we won't even see that result immediately. Maybe going back, looking back in time, we'll say, ah, I see, I see. Paul said, I, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What happens to us is far outweighed by the glory which shall be revealed in us in this life and in the next life. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, happen to us because it's a part of refinement. God is refining us. He allows these things. When you pull crude out of the ground, <coughs> they don't immediately put it in your gas tank. You know that? And there are different types of crude. I know this because I worked for an energy company for four years. And it was my job at one point during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, it was my job to watch what a barrel of wreck sweet crew is going for each day, report it back to my general manager, and together we would come up with our first fill price was going to be on fuel oil. And that was some tough times because crude oil was way up there. We were charging four fifty a gallon for uh, number two fuel oil. That's tough. That's hard. My dad paid 59 cents a gallon for it when I was a kid. But they're different types of crew. The stuff that comes out of the North Sea 
is, is light sweet. What that means is the sulfur content is not as high. It's a low sulfur content, it's easy to refine, and you can refine that into gasoline. Canada has that same type of fuel oil. Saudi Arabia has a very high sulfur, tarry, thick, it's thick coming out of the ground. And they have to, they, they, to refine that, use, they use that a lot for plastics and things, because it's very, it's not cost efficient, it's very expensive to refine it into gasoline. I know the news tells you that the price of oil is high in Saudi Arabia. That's a game they all play. But how do they refine that? They heat it up and they let it cool. And then they, and that burns off some of the impurities. And then they heat it up and then they let it cool. And they heat it up and they let it cool. Do you ever feel like that's what's happening here? Like he heats it up and then lets it cool. It's hot, it's cool. It's hot, it's cool. Peter said that. Peter talked about that in 1 Peter in chapter 1. He says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than that of gold perish, that though it be tried with fire, might be found on the praise and honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. I don't like when the heat is on. I am by nature a whiner and complainer. I am. I'll just I'll confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another. You may be healed. I complain. I don't like it. In chapter 4, verse 12, he said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing is happening. What's going on? Why, why do I have to have these trials? You don't know how many times. There's two, two great needs in every man. We said one is that to ask why. The other one is the need to tell a story. And I fulfill telling my story quite a bit. Thank God for my wife. You know how many times in our married life? We've been married 35 years. I say I'm happily married for 35 years. She's been married for 35 years. You know. <laughs> but uh, how many times I've said to Kim, what's going to happen? Just got to trust God. It always works out. I can't see my way through. And I worry about things that, don't, that haven't even happened. Have you been there? Have you done that? Have you bought the t-shirt? Do you know what it's like to be married to someone like that? Talk to my wife after church. I'll let you know. Oh my gosh, David, it hasn't even happened. What are you worried about? I said, well, it could happen. It might happen. She says, it probably will happen. I don't scare me like that. <laughs> Sometimes, it's overwhelming. But there's not. Sometimes we go through things, this is, I'm going to conclude now with this, sometimes bad things happen so that he can bring us to a better place. I lost a job. I've lost a lot of jobs. Uh, but that sounds good. If I just leave it at that and leave, boy, could you imagine the conclusions you would draw? <laughs> I lost a job uh, when I worked at EDS. All 300 of us lost that job. And I remember our client, we, we were, I worked in the AT&T project, I was managing a team, and my, my AT&T client said, that he lost his job too. I'd like to have had his severance, but that, we'll talk about that some other time. But he said to me, he said, you know, David, he said, I have found that whenever these things happen, you always step into something better later on. And guess what? Where I'm working now is better than when I worked at EDS. So I lost, I moved to a banking project on that job, and that only lasted a short time, and guess what happened? That client pulled out from us too. So that was uh, in uh, early, I forget what year, I get my years mixed up, but I, anyhow. Uh, I ended up then, uh, I got a phone call one day because somebody wanted a reference for this young woman that I worked with reference for her to be employed by the energy company I worked with. And the guy said to me, he had worked at ES at one time, he said, hey, what are you going to be doing? I said, I don't know. He said, well, no, I wonder me. I wanted to spend that summer on a 
on unemployment with my kids. Guess what? I got the job. And it was a better job. And then four years later, I went to work one day. I knew I had, I had had a team of 40 that went down to two. I knew it was probably going to come. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But, and I went in one Friday and the GM and the regional distribution manager came into my office and sat down. And I thought they were getting to tell me that they were going to let Julie and Steve go. And guess what they did. But then the GM said to me, now David, you know how this works. You're going to get a packet in the mail. I said, oh, you're letting me go too. <laughs> That was April. And, I, and then I got a call from someone who said, one of the temp agencies that I used to use to hire people, the guy said, well, I want to hire you. I said, you can't afford me. And guess what? He couldn't. But then he said to me, why don't you go over and talk to these people at this manufacturing company? And I went to work there. That was from April to August. Guess what happened then? <laughs> they got rid of their sales team. Guess what happened next? Uh, the girl that I gave the reference for and her husband, I worked with him at EDS too, they came to my house, they made me fill out an application, they took my resume and he said, I'm taking this to, I just don't think where I work, I'm done with him. I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I've been there eight years now. So one of two things going to happen now. Either they're going to drag me out of there uh, one day, dead, or I'm going to live long enough to retire. But each step, I got to a better place. I didn't like it at the time. Didn't like being laid off. Didn't like losing. You know, when I left, when I left Klaus Manufacturing, it was only there four months, and I was a tenant, and they called me down, they said, they called me to the, their conference room was in another building. They handed me a letter. They don't hand a town a letter, a letter of recommendation here. And every time, you know what I said to people when they let me go? Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yes. You never leave, can I say this without offending, you never leave a place with mistletoe hanging on the back of your belt. You can't do that. Think about that. We can talk about that in the parking lot. <laughs> but in Deuteronomy, in chapter 8, why did the children of Israel go through all the things they did? He tells us that he wanted to bring them into a land that was flowing with milk and honey. He wanted to, their journeys through those 40 years was so that they could be in a place where they could be blessed. God can turn tragedy into triumph. He can give beauty for ashes and he can turn sorrow into joy. There was a young man whose father was a minister and his mother was a piano teacher. And he became, he, his mother taught him, he taught him how to play the piano. He became a very, very gifted composer of blues and soul music. He was well known in this country, very successful. And he married, a, he, he helped start soul, these soul groups and these blues bands. We're going back some years, this is the 1920s and 30s. And he married a woman named Betty, a young woman, and she was a costume designer for these performers and performances. But God began to speak to his heart. Began to draw him back to his roots of being a Christian. And the Lord said to him, you need to get right with me. And he did. He got right with God. And then him and Betty went into the ministry. He became a minister. He became a he helped churches establish their worship and their music. And he became an evangelist. And things were going very good for them. And then he was expecting their first child. Wow. Very healthy young couple. The baby wasn't due for quite some time, and Tom was his name. Thomas went on to a revival meeting several hours away. And while he was at that revival meeting at that city one afternoon, he was given a telegram that said, Nettie has died. He was unable to drive. 
He was just so beside himself. One of the men at the revival drove him several hours home. And I watched an interview of him talking about this. He said, as soon as the car pulled up in front of the house, the was first stop, he said, I ran into the house immediately to see if this thing was true and hoping that it was wrong, that there was something wrong with that telegram. And he said, when I ran into the house, there was one of the young ladies there, and she said, then he died, then he died, then he died. He said it was such a terrible blow to him. He didn't know what he was going to do. The pain was excruciating. She had given birth to a little baby boy. Two days later, that little boy died. He said he was in his house and there were people there. Nothing they could say could help him. Nothing. He said it couldn't then and it couldn't now. And he was given his testimony 40 some years later. And he said, I just kept saying, Lord, what am I going to do? Lord, what am I going to do? Lord, what am I going to do? And one of the men there, an older man, said, that's not his name. He said, what do you mean? He said, his name isn't Lord. It's precious Lord. You see that Tom was Thomas Dorsey, who became one of the most prolific hymn writers of the 20th century. And he said, when that man said to me, his name is Precious Lord. He said instantaneously, he said, I began to sing a song that I had never written before, but it just came out of my mouth. He said, I began to sing Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my light is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my 